Okay, so pro tips for builders on AWS. Okay, so as builders, we obviously want flexible tooling, right? So uh, tooling can be anything. It could be an IDE, it could be a command line interface, um, it could be some commands that uh, have been uh, produced by the open, uh, the open source community. Uh, as far as I know, there is, is anyone still writing code in VI and then hand compiling it or creating machine code? No, right, you are? You're not supposed to say that, right? <laughs> um, the idea is that tooling helps us, helps us become more proficient, more agile, and build things really cool faster. Okay, and of the stuff that we build, we wanna be able to observe, um, observe it, so we measure it. We measure the uh, various aspects of our system, and then lastly, we never get everything right the first go, right? So how's that VI coding going with for you, right? <laughs> so we, we, wanna, we wanna have uh, rapidity in our processes, okay? And so we're gonna focus, and this is where we differ from what Gabe ran in Sydney. Gabe focused on the system observability, uh, observation side of things. Uh, I'm not gonna focus on that. I'm gonna focus on the, f the first one and the last one, uh, and I'm also gonna, the reason why is that I, I was gonna focus on this and then I ran out of time. Um, so I have got a little uh, sort of a, a preview in uh, CDK that we're gonna touch on at the end, and CDK is our cloud development kit. Okay, so here's where our history starts. Now, yeah, I get it, you can read this stuff here, right? These URLs, and so, like, yeah, the answer's probably in there, so I'm not gonna, so does anyone know what that is? It's a teletype, right, and how would I know that the public sector community would know what that is? <laughs> um, it, does anyone still have any functioning teletypes in their offices? No, right, okay. That's, yeah, that's a, that's a teletype model 33, all the way back in 1963. Uh, and these things, uh, kind of like an evolution on Morse code, right? They spoke over rudimentary, slow, uh, usually dial-up lines. Uh, I think at max they would get about 100 words per minute, and so the person would type on one end, and the recipient, somewhere else on the other end of that slow dial-up line would receive the message, right? That's pretty much um, what the tele, uh, teletype was all about, teleprinter. And, first question, it was one of the very first ASCII devices. What does ASCII stand for? Okay, I heard a bunch of mumbling, but I heard something from there, what was it? Cool, see me after to get a $100 credit. Cool, see how easy it is? Just pay attention. <laughs> uh, so they, they built about 750,000 of these. The, <laughs> you're looking at the answers. <laughs> um, uh, 500,000th of this thing was actually gold-plated and put on display somewhere, probably one of the Living Computer Museum in Seattle or something like that. Uh, but yeah, so that's the, that's, the, that's the Teletype Model 33. And hopefully you'll be able to see where we're going with that. And another interesting fun fact is that the basic operating system was designed um, with the teletype in mind, operating over slow uh, dial-up connections. So it kind of leads us into Multics. So Multics, 1965, Glenda Schroeder um, came up with the very first interactive shell, um, and uh, Multics was the operating system that that shell was created on. So you can see where we're going here, right? So now we're starting to have this concept of an interactive shell. When we had these teletypes, we were just typing something and someone would get the, the printout at the other end and if it was to do something on a computer, they would then go off and do it. Having an interactive shell would allow us to interact with a computer without having to have someone on the other end of it. So we we're moving, removing one sort of human from the, from the equation here. So yeah, Mult uh, Multics uh, was in uh, 1965 and also was the root of essentially all modern operating systems. Anyone know what this is? So I came from, I came from Digital Equipment Corporation and we had VT100s, VT220s, all of that cool stuff. So this was the, the data point 3300, which is the very, one of the very first glass TTYs, right? And if you've ever been on a Unix system and you, you go into the slash dev and you see these TTY files, that's where TTY came from, right? Teletype. And the glass teletype, the data point 3300, was modeled on that teletype, the 33 we saw in the first slide. And this enabled us to take that interactive shell and then remove it, like put it at a distance from the computer, right? So now we could have these, these terminals um, that were not in the same building as the mainframe, right? So we could 
start doing our shell commands um, from, the, from the glass TTY. And so all of the, if you put all of these things together, we kind of end up with what we have today as the modern CLI, right? And AWS is no different. Well, we, have, uh, we have our own CLI, so if you're like me, I started at uh, Amazon back in 2013 in AWS as a solutions architect. Um, and the CLI then was very different from what the CLI is now. Does anyone, is anyone familiar with the old CLIs, AWS? So every service that came out had its own CLI, so you had to download a separate CLI to function with uh, that service. And so I think about 2014, they came up with the unified CLI, which is what you see today. And so pretty much most, if not all, services within AWS have um, the option or the ability to be controlled via the AWS command line. So why do we like the AWS command line? Well, the same reason why we like command lines for any other uh, platform, whether it's an operating system or another framework. So once, it's rapidity, right? We can do things very quickly on it. Composability, we can pipe the output of one command in as the input to another command. If I'm writing something on the screen, it's pretty obvious what I'm doing, right? And then the last one is repeatability. I can put all of these commands into a file, into a bash script or some sort of PowerShell script and I can run them and I can do it over and over again and get the same results. Should get the same results. So here's one of the first demos that um, I'm gonna show. There's, there's actually three things we're gonna look at here. One is the standard AWS command line interface. Um, the second is SOARS. Has anyone heard of supercharged AWS? No? That's great, so hopefully, I, all I want is you to take one thing away at the end of today, and if, if you haven't heard of SOARS or even the AWS CLI, it's a good start. Okay, so the CLI is the first thing, I said SOARS, and then lastly, I'm gonna touch on uh, another community, so SOARS is a community um, developed project, and there's the last one. Now I'm gonna, there's not that many people here. Ian McKay, is he in the audience? No, he's from Sydney, he's actually one of our, um, community contributors, so I'm gonna demo his uh, AWS console recorder. Okay, has anyone used the AWS console recorder? No? It's excellent, could get three for three tonight. Okay, so let's, uh, let's get started. So, so here I'm working on S3, um, I'm creating a bucket, make bucket, uh, all S3 buckets have to have a globally unique name. Okay, so there's my bucket, I'm gonna list the buckets, to show you that the bucket was actually created. Notice the output in JSON, we'll come back to that. We're gonna create a few more buckets with um, globally unique names. And then we're gonna run list buckets again just to show you what's happening on the, on the back end. Remember, you know, S3 is just one of the many services that we have. Like you could use, you could put AWS EC2 if you wanted to do operations against EC2. So there's our output, JSON again. JSON is the default output. If we don't like that and we wanna have uh, plain text, we can do that. We can just dash dash output, or we can have table um, as the output option as well. And so that's pretty much uh, uh, applicable syntax for any AWS CLI command. Okay, so what we're gonna do now, we're gonna just create a directory on our local file system, and we're just gonna touch some files. It doesn't matter about the size here, I'm not showing you anything to do with the size of the files, but I'm showing you how we can actually synchronize a local directory structure and the contents of that structure to an S3 bucket. And we're all using the command line interface here, right? There's nothing special. I don't have to write. I don't have to write any uh, speci you know, code and uh, leverage the Boto3 API client libraries and so on. Okay, so that's what we're going to sync. Okay, list the buckets again, right? And we're going to synchronize that local uh, structure to that bucket. This is actually one of the most common AWS CLI commands that I guess DevOps people use, right? So how many people here do use CLI on a regular basis? Yeah, so you use the sync, okay, so this is not new. But uh, for those who haven't used it before, yeah, you get quite a bit of power at your fingertips just at, uh, using the CLI. Okay, and then we can uh, list the contents of the bucket and then we'll be able to see um, there are those zero files zero size files that we touched earlier on. Yeah, we can remove the bucket as well. Yeah, obviously the default uh, isn't gonna allow us to do that, so we need to specify the force flag. Okay, so that's the, that's the CLI. And you know, the, one, of the, one of the daunting things about the CLI is that we have over, I think there's 70 commands and 2,000 subcommands for the AWS 
command line interface, which is, in, it's, it's insane, right? How are you gonna remember all that stuff? So um, enter SOARS, which is supercharged AWS. So this is a community-driven uh, project, as I mentioned. Um, SOARS is effectively a wrapper around the AWS CLI. And in addition to, you know, the same uh, service APIs we saw, we have, you know, operation auto completion. Uh, we also have uh, resource auto completion as well. So if you don't know the name of your bucket, you can just start typing the first few characters and then it will show us what buckets we have available to us. Um, it's color coded. It's good stuff. It's, it, it, there should be no reason why you actually use the CLI other than using it through this, right? I'm not saying don't install the CLI because this actually leverages the CLI under the hood. If you want documentation, you can type um, help and you'll get the man style documentation or docs. It will take you to the, to the, uh, the AWS web documentation pages. So that's good stuff. Uh, SOARS, I highly suggest, and you, if you scan when you leave, you'll get a copy of all these, PDF, this, these slides in a PDF. Unfortunately, you won't get the, the videos because videos don't go too well in PDFs, um, but you can always contact me afterwards if you want a copy of the videos. I can give you a link to a, a Dropbox somewhere that you can take them. Okay, so here's just another example. Uh, it's probably too late in the day to really go over what we're doing here in any great detail. Uh, but it's effectively getting a list of, using the uh, AWS CLI to get a list of um, uh, identity uh, access management roles, and we're going to iterate through all those roles um, where they're attached to a policy, right? And um, if they are attached to a policy, uh, we're going to de uh, detach it, detach the role name here. Uh, and then once we've done that, then we can actually, so it's delete the policies from the role, then we delete the role. Okay, so that's just a, a simple bash script. So that just shows uh, that repeatability that we talked about earlier on. Okay, so two or three. The third one that I talked about, this is in McKay. So Ian, who's based in Sydney, this is his code. Uh, he has uh, released a new out, uh, plugin for a browser called Cloudformer, which does something very similar. Um, but what, we, uh, what we're doing here, we're just gonna uh, install uh, the browser plugin for console recorder. So this is, this is really helpful for people who like playing in the AWS console, but aren't quite sure what happens on the back end. So this will actually record all of the commands, all the, the operations you're doing in the console, and then generate the resulting output for you. Okay, so whilst this has been installing in Firefox here, we're gonna go across to the console, and we're gonna create an IAM role uh, then we're going to create an EC2 instance. We're going to attach that role to it, okay? And then we're going to see what the output is. So what we're going to do here, the first thing we need to do is start um, the recording. And so now everything we do in the console is going to be recorded. Okay, so this is creating our role. We're just putting in some, it's not important what we're doing here, it's more important just to understand that we are recording everything that's going on. Give our role a name, make note of that name, we're using it in the creation of an EC2 instance. Okay, now we're gonna go across to EC2. We're gonna launch that instance. This is actually a really, I really like this. Um, there's some other features of the console recorder that we don't touch on here, um, but uh, if you're wanting to get into CDK or if you use Terraform, this also spits out Terraform code as well and CDK code. We're probably doing a little bit too much here to, to get the point across, but this is Gabe's uh, presentation, so um, I, I'm gonna go with it. Okay, so we're gonna tag um, our EC2 instance. Okay, configure our security group. We might just add a new rule as well. Okay, add rule. So good scenario for doing this. Uh, let's say you wanna create a process that's repeatable. Uh, you're not really familiar with the console, but you know how to do it. Sorry, you're not familiar with the CLI, but you're familiar with the console. Do it in the console, do it once, record it, and then stop recording once you've done. That's the default um, Python uh, equivalent of what you just did in the uh, console. But this is what we're interested in here, right? Because we're talking about the CLI. So you'll see like all of that stuff we were just doing then spits out this. Um, now, 
a lot of this stuff is not necessary to do anything. Like when we're doing describe, that's just getting a list of things, some metadata that describes the resource that we're working in. Um, but uh, if you were effectively to run that again, you would kind of get everything you just did in the console plus a whole bunch of other uh, uh, sort of text appearing on the screen that describes the various things that you're uh, creating. Uh, CloudFormation, uh, who, who works in CloudFormation here? Okay, right, you should never work in CloudFormation again once CDK is, is considered stable, right? And I'll talk about that shortly. Uh, so if you like CloudFormation, uh, that spits out CloudFormation too. So is that cool? Does anyone think that we're gonna probably use something like this? I think, I think you should, it's really good. <coughs> Great. Okay, so that's, um, See, I told you, you don't need to take photos of this unless you don't want to scan, but I suggest you scan, because then you get the, uh, the entire deck. Okay, so the CLI we saw, uh, our supercharged AWS, and then our AWS console recorder. Okay, who is this? No. Uh, there's, 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 no there's no credits for getting the guy's name, because it's up there, it's Ivan Sutherland. Um, but what, what does anyone know what Sketchpad is or was? He was the pioneer of graphics. Of graphics, yeah. So he, he's basically the father of the modern user interface or the graphical user interface. So come see me afterwards, you get 100. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I've only given away how much? 200 bucks so far. 400 to go. All right, don't mind. We'll get there. Uh, okay, so yeah, uh, I, uh, Ivan Sutherland in 1962. Uh, it looks almost like the precursor to the, to the modern sort of tablet, but um, actually was the precursor to the modern user interface, graphical user interface. Um, and so, does anyone know what this is? So now, like, you can look at this and you can go, ah, small talk, right? If you told me small talk, you wouldn't be getting any credits, because although small talk had a role in this, does anyone know what, what operating system this was? Xerox what? Alto, I'll give you 100, yeah. <laughs> I'll give you 100, I can't do 50 because I've bundled them in $100 lots, so. <laughs> yeah, so this is the, this is the, um, the, the Xerox uh, Alto's uh, user interface. So this is where we can start to see this whole concept of um, layering of windows and dragging and dropping things. And Smalltalk, um, yes, Smalltalk uh, is kind of, there's some things related to Smalltalk around it. Smalltalk was instrumental in the development of the Xerox Alto. Um, I was actually lucky enough to work with Alan Kay, who was one of the original uh, founders of, or developers of um, Smalltalk. He's a great guy. Um, so I love to name drop him whenever I get an opportunity, and that's not often. So, um, so yeah, so this was, so this was, this kind of interface was pivotal as, you know, for getting to where we are today with the modern uh, IDEs, right? Because without um, these graphical user interfaces, we really wouldn't be able to have these modern IDEs. And, um, I highly encourage you, if you're still writing in VI, maybe to look into IDEs. <laughs> um, so, okay, so now, you, all right, I'm gonna give away 100 for this. What IDE is it? Is it the nope. Who said that? Okay, 100. <laughs> yeah, so, so I, I would have taken PyCharm, IntelliJ, or, or, um, or WebStorm. All right, it's basically a JetBrains IDE. Um, so this is actually, um, this is, this is uh, debugging a Lambda function in, in modern IDE, right, which in this case is IntelliJ. Uh, obviously IntelliJ with the AWS Toolkit running. And this is where, what we're gonna talk about next, which is the AWS Toolkit. Okay, so in, in this demo, before I kick it off, what's actually happening is that um, there's an API gateway endpoint um, that is all it's basically set up to do is that when it receives a GET request, it's gonna call a Lambda function, that's it, right? So don't be too concerned with what we're gonna do with this Lambda function, just know that the Lambda function will get invoked um, when we in issue a GET request to this um, API gateway endpoint. So this is uh, Visual Studio Code with AWS Toolkit, and how do we know the AWS Toolkit has been enabled? It's this little thing here. Okay, so we're gonna create a new, uh, a new SAM application. I've got $300, what does SAM stand for? Sorry? Yeah, okay, that's good, yeah. Okay, so while, you know, when we create our new SAM application, we obviously we have to give it a name, we have to give it uh, an S3 bucket and a region where we're gonna be deploying this, um, this uh, serverless application. So when we create the application, we get the standard uh, boilerplate code 
Um, in this case, all it's doing is saying hello world. So this is showing us running it locally. It's actually pretty cool how this SAM stuff works. It basically bundles it all up as a Docker container and then allows us to run, run it so that we know what we're running locally is exactly what we're gonna get running um, in the cloud. There's our output here in JSON, okay? So just like other applications that we build in IDEs, um, the AWS Toolkit allows us to do debugging, local debugging as well, so we can set breakpoints. So in this case, when we debug it locally, when our breakpoint is hit, our code is gonna stop execution. We then have access to the context so we can look at the variable states and everything. We have access to the, uh, the debug console so we can um, issue, uh, uh, I guess, any kind of expression that you wanna um, execute against the context. So if anyone wants to see a more um, complex, uh, uh, I guess, demonstration of this. I did one for AWS Innovate. Has anyone seen, has anyone paid any notice to Innovate? So yeah, so what I take um, AWS config events, um, I pass them through a Lambda function, Lambda pulls them apart, and we put them into a Neptune database, and then we can visualize the dependency map of AWS resources. Okay, so now we're gonna deploy it. So we're happy with how it runs locally, we've debugged it locally, we think we're, we think we're good. Um, we can go and deploy it. Here's where we specify our S3 bucket. Now, you, you don't need to do this at all to write Lambda functions, right? You can go into the AWS console, you can write Lambda, then you can, you know, you can set everything up manually and go to run it, but it's, it's a pain. It's, it's an absolute pain to get it um, working through the console. So using the AWS toolkit in the IDE is, is, is the easiest and fastest, and we talk about rapidity, right? This is the rapidity um, aspect of it. So it takes a while to package everything up and deploy it. So what it's doing now, as I said, it packages it all up and we have this CloudFormation template that's gonna get uh, uploaded to AWS. Um, the stack is gonna get deployed, it goes through the resources, sets up the Lambda function and all of that. And then once it's done, then we'll be able to go across to the console, just quickly verify that everything has been set up and then test that function out. Does anyone use Sam? Troy? Okay, so I love how Gabe wanted to show exactly how long it took to deploy um, a Lambda function. <laughs> um, normally what I do is kind of go, here's one we were prepared earlier. Um, but this is, this is kind of typical. Uh, it, it doesn't take too long, regardless of like, how big your code is, it, it doesn't really take any longer, right? It's just the process that um, is, is required to get it up there. Yes, yes, everything. You, you, you don't need to do anything um, in terms of the packaging, um, your code, it just does it all for you. Okay, um, we're still going, we're still going. Uh, let's see if I can, uh, yeah, great, I'll just advance that. Um, it comes back, it says deployed successfully. Okay, so we go into the AWS console. How am I doing for time? Is that really, am I over five? Well, the other guy's over five, so I'm getting my five minutes back. Um, <laughs> So here's our uh, CloudFormation. This is our stack that we deployed. Okay, um, there's more qu quiz coming up in a minute, so don't run. I know drinks are not gonna go. Um, here's our uh, serverless API that we deployed as part of that CloudFormation template. So what we're gonna do is go to that uh, API gateway endpoint. So that's our get um, request that maps to that Lambda function. You'll see here if we click on get, this is the, the Lambda function here that it calls, so it integrates with that. So we're gonna find our production endpoint, and we're simply gonna plug that into a browser to issue that GET request. And what are we gonna see? Hello world, that's right. Bam, there you go, hello world. Okay, couldn't be easier. Okay, so AWS Toolkits for popular um, IDEs, there is Eclipse up there as well, but I don't know if people still use Eclipse these days, so, um, but yes, Eclipse is one, Visual Studio uh, Code. Uh, I would say all of the JetBrains, it doesn't have to be IntelliJ or PyCharm, just say the JetBrains um, IDEs. 
Um, when Gabe presented this at the Sydney summit, um, it hadn't uh, been made generally available for Visual Studio Code. That is uh, not the case now. It is now generally available. So everything you can do um, in IntelliJ or PyCharm, you can now do in Visual Studio, uh, Visual Studio Code. OK. Question. What? What, did I, hang on, what? what is it? It's a loom, yes. And who invented this? Yuck, yes. OK. Uh, he, he actually didn't invent the loom. He invent, invented the apparatus, which was the system of uh, the chain cards, yeah. Um, and effect, effectively, you know, these, these, these holes in these cards would determine you know, what way these control rods went and which would impact the, you know, the, 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 the way the wealth, and I don't know enough about uh, looming and, and material science or industry, but fabric industry. Uh, but that affected the outcome of what the pattern on the, on the material looked like. So yeah, the jacket apparatus. So you can see me. Have you, you already seen me for another hundred bucks? No. <laughs> okay. Okay. So this is where this is this is entering my sort of time frame now. So what's this? Assembler for what? Like, what? What processor? So it's a Motorola. Sixty-eight thousand six eight XO. Um, so I've got, I've got $100, $100 of credits left. Uh, so yes, I sort of fed you the details that it was a Motorola 68000 assembler. Does anyone know what BLE stands for, the mnemonic BLE? Yeah, who's that? <laughs> Does anyone know what RTS is? You, yeah, it's always the same people. Okay, um, I'm going to shut my eyes in a minute and just pick someone because <laughs> I don't have any more questions. Um, yeah, so this is this is the Amiga, this is the assembler. Uh, this was actually source code from Noise Tracker, which was one of the very first sequencing um, music music sequencing applications written for any computer. Um, so yeah, and this is where we're getting with CDK. So. CDK is a cloud development kit, and I said you should never write CloudFormation again, and that is true because CloudFormation is the new assembler, right? So CDK allows us to write in more imperative language, such as Node or Python or some kind of .NET derivative, and spit out CloudFormation for us, right? It's way easier, way, way easier. So I'm just going to quickly go through here. I do zoom in on this, so that is not the size of it, and this is a relatively short demo. Um, so I'm actually just taking you through the, the initial. So I'm assume, I've made the assumption that CDK is installed here. So this is how you initialize a CDK project. You basically just say CDK in it. You give it the language that you want to develop in. I think the default is Node. I like working in Python because I don't like Node. Um, and that's the only option I have. Right? I can't write in any. I'd like to write in Rust, but I can't. Um, OK, so I'm integrating my project with the IDE. Uh, I use PyCharm. And really, all I'm doing is just wrapping that, that project with a virtual environment. I'm just setting this up. OK. OK, we're all good. And so one of the, one of the things we have to do when we're working with the IDE, um, even if you're not working with the IDE, there's when you run the CDK in it, it tells you you've got to run some commands. And those commands essentially just go and get the, the packages and install the packages locally on your box. And those packages are the bindings for the node, uh, the node um, library of CDK. So even though I don't like working with node, CDK is written in node. And the Python uh, interface is, is essentially a bridge to that node. OK, so I'm just going to work. What I'm going to do here, I'm going to create a VPC. Um, one of the most you know, primitive sort of resources you can create in an AWS environment. So because I'm creating a VPC, I need to make sure that I use the CDK EC2 module. I'm just going to use pip, the Python install here, to install those requirements. Um, once, the, uh, once the requirements have uh, been installed, I can then just write, uh, type CDK synth. And CDK synth just uh, essentially does a sanity check of my code to make sure it's all good. Um, if you don't get any errors here, and I suggest everyone do CDK synth first, because if you get errors, it means you've installed something wrong. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go across. I'm going to create um, a stack, or I'm going to modify a stack that, uh, that's been created for me, an empty stack. 
which is my CDK demo stack, right? It's just a standard, this is just a standard Python class with an, with an initialized um, uh, constructor. I'm importing my uh, module in that, uh, in that code. And then I'm gonna type this, vpc equals ec2.vpc. Notice, because I've got it in the ID, I get all the auto completion and every, all the other cool stuff, which um, you may not get uh, in the same um, environment that you're editing CloudFormation in. The other good thing too, if you forget what you're doing, if you're in an IDE, like you can look at the parameters and see there's a ton of parameters. It tells you which ones are optional, which ones are mandatory. So this is, uh, this is my, my VPC attributes I'm specifying here. I'm gonna give it uh, uh, an upper bound of two max, of two AZs, and I'm also gonna create two uh, NAT gateways as well. Um, that's all I'm gonna do. That's all that this demo is gonna do. I'm gonna then do CDK synth, and I'm gonna show you the output of that. So look at, look, at, look at how much code it was to create a VPC. One line, right? So let's generate our CloudFormation output. Now you don't have to take, manually take that output and, and upload it to CloudFormation to the console. You can do CDK deploy and it will automatically deploy that um, for you uh, to the cloud. So here's the code, right? So I didn't have to write any of that CloudFormation. I didn't have to remember any of the, the attributes or anything like that. Like, what's easy to write, this or the other thing, right? I know what, I know what I'd rather uh, codify my infrastructure in. Okay, so I'm, I'm well, I, was wait, I was like five minutes, and now I'm two minutes over. I don't know how that works. Anyway, thank you um, for that. I appreciate you turning up for the last session of the day. I hope you got something out of it. Um, there's some cool stuff here. Uh, if you wanna, you can talk to me anytime. Uh, that's my, my Twitter. Uh, my Twitter handle, or it can just be mattfits at amazon.com as well. If anyone's interested in emailing me, I'm always happy to chat. Uh, there's a lot more to this stuff than what I just, I had 30 minutes to do it, and I did it in probably 40 minutes, so. Um, so for those who got credits, come down and see me. Um, just, if you've got a phone, just take a photo, because the credits are actually, there's five credits in a block, and so I don't have any real cool way to hand them out, so. Okay, guys, thank you. Done. Enjoy the rest of your day and weekend. Thanks.